Kit, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for being here. My pleasure. So tell us, how did you guys come across these documents that led you to knowing about this project Alchemy? Well, um, at the Grey Zone, we've been reporting on leaks um, <clears throat> for uh, for uh, almost as long as the, the war has been ongoing, um, which reveal uh, the scale of Britain's um, uh, role in uh, prosecuting and uh, escalating the, uh, the uh, Ukraine proxy war. Um, and right. I think that at this uh, at, at this rather interesting juncture where the proxy war appears to be um, uh, mere weeks away from uh, termination, uh, it felt like a, a good time to release them. Okay. So what is Project Alchemy? Who Who's in this project? So in your piece that you wrote, you say that it's a group of military and intelligence figures. Are they all British or are these NATO? Do they include United States military and intelligence? No, um, I mean, this is this, this is all um, uh, British uh, um, uh, military and intelligence people, but it's also very oddly like academics too, um, some of whom have uh, quite uh, sizable uh, public footprints, and we'll be reporting on on um, on, on that in weeks to come. Um, but yeah, um, it, it appears that uh, this this cabal, um, this secret cell created by the Ministry of Defence, had an enormous influence on um, how the proxy war has been prosecuted by Western powers, and there are references to um, wanting to influence U.S. thinking um, on on matters related to the proxy war. So it, it stands to reason that this will have been being fed to the U.S. government as well. Yeah. So question about that. That's interesting. Do you think, I mean, we're going to get into more details about Project Alchemy with the Kerch Bridge bombing, the attacks on the media, the, the targeting like the gray zone and all the censorship. Mm -hmm. But um, just from what you, you've just said, this this attempt to even sway the United States, who do you think really truly wanted this war in Ukraine and Russia to happen? Do you think that this is more pushed by the British or do you think this is pushed more by the United States? Well, I mean, it's a, it's a mixed bag. And of course, I mean, um, the, U, the US via the, the National Endowment for Democracy, that CIA front, um, uh, was responsible for the Maidan coup. Um, although what's rather right. forgotten is that in the wake of in the wake of Maidan, um, that well-known peacenik, Barack Obama, um, he didn't escalate um, in Ukraine. Indeed, he recognized that Ukraine was a core um, geopolitical interest of Russia and not the US. So he uh, ref uh, didn't um, uh, provide significant support to the post Maidan government um, for fear of escalating the situation. Um, the British have um, had no qualms uh, about uh, training um, paramilitary units which went on to commit horrendous uh, atrocities against the civilian population of the Donbass uh, between 2014 and 2022. Um, they had zero qualms about training the Ukrainians in torture and um, uh, uh, carrying out um, assassinations and, um, and terror attacks in, in, through during this period. Um, there is a um, individual I've, who is uh, connected to Project Alchemy called um, Chris Donnelly. Um, he was the mastermind of the, the Kerch Bridge bombing. Um, he is this veteran NATO advisor uh, and um, uh, British Ministry of Defense apparatchik who's now uh, part of British military intelligence. And he's uh, been leading Britain's contribution to the war in Ukraine on an explicitly escalatory um, uh, 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 strategy. Um, in 2014, an organisation he ran called the Institute for Statecraft, in, I think it was July 2014, they, pub they openly published a um, essay on their website stating that Russia needed to be subject to international economic boycott, um, uh, it had to be diplomatically isolated and demonised with black propaganda and this would lead to co uh, armed conflict of the old-fashioned sort between Russia and, uh, and the West, which the West could win. 
Um, so, um, it, and it's clear that Donnelly was, yes, as I say, coordinating with uh, nationalist elements in Ukraine following Maidan. So, um, with a strong argument could be made that, it, that the current conflict in Ukraine is a direct product of British intelligence meddling. Mm. What would be even the motivation to this? I mean, you have in your piece, you write about the public manipulation that in order to maintain British public support for the war, that Project Alchemy planned propaganda campaigns to justify the rising costs and the lower living standards. So the Brits were going to suffer. They know they knew this. I mean, they have it in this in these documents that you've uncovered that, yeah, they knew that, hey, you guys are all going to suffer. I mean, what would be the point of trying to destabilize Russia and Ukraine, knowing that it was going to lead to not only a crisis for the British as far as lower living standards, because maybe there's going to be gas cutoffs or, you know, trade issues and whatever. But on top of that, you would create a, a, a major immigration crisis, which is what's happened. I mean, we're seeing floods of Ukrainians being um, brought into Europe. The Irish have taken a disproportionately high number of Ukrainian refugees. You, if you if you then I mean, luckily, luckily, actually, Russia has not their economy has not tanked. Their economy has done better. So they're fine economically. But imagine if they actually, if they, if this plan that Project Alchemy had and this whole, this whole idea of collapsing Russia, I mean, imagine if that would have worked. Not only would there be a flood of Ukrainian refugees going all over, but there would be floods of Russians fleeing as well. Mm -hmm. And yet, and everybody would have to absorb all of these people. So what would be the, why would they even want, like what in the world is the reasoning for wanting to collapse Russia. I, I just, this is so beyond me. I just cannot, it was Germany, by the way, you know, World War I and World War II that the British were against. It wasn't Russia. So in fact, Russia was helping. So what, what would be, you know, it, and now look at the German economy, super strong, right? I mean, there's been no attempts to ever try to, you know, when you're thinking about the logic of this, like why would they want to collapse Russia? And the, the, the reasoning would be, well, it's because they don't want them to rise up, become a powerful force and then take over Europe. Well, it was the Germans that were trying to do that before. And yet they built up the German economy quite strong and Germans, Germany's now in on all, unless this is, unless the, the, unless really, if we get down to the deep secret real cabal and it's really the Nazis never left and they're still <laughs> running Germany and they're still trying to conquer and they're still going after the Russians. I mean, that's the only thing that actually makes genuine sense to me is that maybe we just absorbed all the Nazis and they still have it out for Russia and they're just hiding now in the UK, the United States and in Argentina, which is actually quite likely. So, you know, I just don't understand the, the reasoning. What, what do you think the reason is for wanting to do this when it's just going to harm everybody in Europe and all the Russians? I mean, what's the point? Well, I mean, I think, I mean, A, that's a huge component of it. Um, and <clears throat> yes, the, the, uh, the, uh, the not, uh, Nazi uh, propaganda and intelligence structures were uh, very easily integrated into the CIA and MI6 um, right. and uh, uh, West German intelligence and NATO. Um, so that's what um, one explanation for it. Um, and I think that you mentioned Russia being on the same side as Britain in World War II. Um, Churchill is alleged to have proclaimed we slaughtered the wrong pig um, after the defeat of Nazi Germany, because uh, it actually um, this is not never really spoken about in the mainstream. But historically, uh, Britain has had um, a major rivalry uh, with an enmity for uh, Russia um, throughout the 1800s, they, the Brit Britain and Russia uh, waged what was known as the Great Game, uh, which was effectively the Cold War before the Cold War, where they used proxy armies and um, spies uh, to attempt, uh, the British did, to, um, uh, to, to try and um, limit Russian influence in Central Asia because they feared Russian inroads into India, which is was the jewel in the crown of the British. British Empire, its most profitable um, component. Um, but the, uh, I mean, they the the Americans supported. Uh, sorry, the Russians supported uh, the, the Americans uh, in the War of Independence. They were on the side of the North um, during the Civil War when Britain supported the South. Um, so they'd all they'd always been a major irritant um, to. Uh, 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 British global dominance, even when they were um, ruled by the Tsars, who were part of the British royal family, um, when um, the communists in 1917 executed them, um, you know, that's 
can't be forgiven and uh britain has ever since had all sorts of fantasies about breaking up uh russia i've reported for my website global delinquents um on um how following world war one um britain along with a number of other countries invaded russia and specifically in advance had in the manner of godfather the god the godfather part two where they're carving up the cake of cuba um like the different parts of uh, different russia resources in different regions were handed out to different western powers and it was just a pr proposed post-war carve-up um and uh once once they uh, crushed communism but they also the british also were um wary of supporting the anti-communist russian resistance because they didn't want a unified russia to emerge um again which is why the effort failed um so i think that given that russia is sitting on all of the all of the world's natural resources um, uh, Britain uh, wants access to that and if there is a strong government in Russia uh, then that can't happen. Um, you know, Boris Yeltsin throughout the 90s um, was a <coughs> brutal dictator who oversaw um, a complete uh, collapse of society and the rise of organized crime and oligarchs um, but the West said nothing because he allowed um, Western finan finan uh, financial interests to rape and pillage Russia. Um, Putin stopped them doing that and therefore became um, their you know internet uh, their bond villain um, as it were and they have and this is repeatedly stated in these Project Alchemy documents, you know, that this will be the end of Putin, we're going to get rid of Putin. Um, and then once that happens, we can access Russian energy and we can integrate Russia into Western financial structures, which is to say, mm -hmm. um, have, the, have, the, have the country carved up by the IMF and the World Bank. Um, and all of its resources sold off, which is what happened in Ukraine after Maidan. The nationalist government signed all sorts of deals with major US corporations like Monsanto. Um, you know, Ukraine has enormous amount of arable land and an enormous amount of natural resources. And they were the post Maidan governments were allowing um, the West to pillage that. Um, and like, so, I mean, they just want to do this on a larger scale in Russia itself. Yeah. I mean, it, uh, but again, all it hurts is the the people in Europe, the British citizens, uh, th that's who it hurts. So, I mean, it's just you know, un unbelievable that they would, that they think that this is a good idea. Let's get to some of the details of Project Alchemy and what they were doing. So one of them was sure. the, the Kerch Bridge bombing. So tell us about, tell us about how Project Alchemy was involved in that. Yeah, sure. So um, the plotting for striking Kerch Bridge, which is a the the a bridge uh, built um, uh, a few years back, connecting mainland Russia with Crimea, and was opened with much fanfare. Um, yeah, the, the, the British started plotting to um, uh, 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 attack that um, like pretty much from day one, um, and then this came to pass in in October and was a major escalatory act that led to Russia starting a wave of strikes on Ukrainian infrastructure, which continue mm -hmm. and mean that Ukraine is going to suffer an absolutely horrendous, very dark, very cold winter very soon uh, with <laughs> with little or no electricity. Um, and a bit that I mean, that's this what that plan was hatched by elements of Project Alchemy. Um, they also uh, um, envisioned uh, creating a Operation Gladio style partisan terror army. Um, people uh, just training Ukrainians, male and female, who could blend in um, with the public and then carry out assassinations and bombings oh. and, um, <clears throat> and escalatory now, acts like that. Remind us, can you Joe, re remind us of what um, what the World War Two, the post World War Two NATO Operation Gladio was, so that people can understand what Project Alchemy yeah. was thinking. Okay, we could do this now in Ukraine. So explain Project Gladio. Yeah, sure. So Operation Gladio was this secret CIA, MI6 and NATO operation um, throughout uh, Western Europe in uh, <clears throat> during the Cold War and under its auspices. 
uh, the CIA and MI6 maintained these secret fascist terror armies um, who carried out bank robberies, uh, mass shootings, um, bo bombings like the destruction of Bologna Rail Station in, in 1980, which killed hundreds of people, including many children. Um, and the purpose was to compel um, Western, uh, well, European citizens to turn to the state for greater security. Um, and uh, it, there was a one individual who was convicted um, uh, of, uh, <clears throat> um, uh, of involvement in one of these groups in Italy, who said that, yes, that the reason that the truth can never come out is that the, the, the state cannot prosecute itself. And yes, it's very clear that, that Gladio played the significant role in shaping European politics um, that was very bloody and, uh, and in, conducted in total secret. We still don't know the full dimensions of it. I mean, I think that in um, <clears throat> it has been openly reported in the West media that there are uh, Ukrainian partisan units who are um, carrying out um, uh, bombings and assassinations in um, Latin, Latin territory occupied by Russia that, Ru uh, that Russia would consider its own. So um, it's clear that, that something did come of this proposal, whether it was this specific proposal, we don't know. Um, we published the, uh, the, pr the PowerPoint proposal document for this, which boasts of how MI6 officers would be training these people and how um, and a, a 1,000 strong um, secret army could be created in a manner of weeks um, by Britain. Um, so, I mean, I think I, I, I think it's 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 it, it's worth going over this stuff. Bearing in mind, yeah. that, yes, it has been um, publicly admitted that these units exist. So we know who was training them um, and where they were being trained. Right. Well, Operation Gladio, they the Italians actually investigated this, right? And they were like, "Hey, it turns out that mm -hmm. all of these supposed terror attacks that were happening, that they were blaming on the Soviets and saying." Oh, well, you know, look at all. And, and also just to to rise up, like you said, the security state, um, the Italians ended up investigating this. And, and, and it's come to light that it was that, yeah, NATO actually did have these sort of stay behind guerrilla groups that would enact these these terror plots. And so now you're saying that Project Alchemy thought, hey, that worked the first time around. Let's go ahead and do that again in Ukraine and uh, and and we'll terrorize the Ukrainian people and the people in the Donbass will just terrorize them and blame it all on the Russians or get them to believe that there's, you know, that they need to ramp up security and whatnot and turn to NATO and, and seek help from NATO. I mean, this is just the type of stuff, you know, when people point out and say, this is a false flag operation and then others call them a conspiracy theorist. And then we find out years later, well, actually it wasn't a theory at all. It was a conspiracy for sure against the people that was put together by their own government. Their own governments are doing this to them. And, and blaming it on something else. I mean, this is just, this is a, a total and complete sickness. I mean, we haven't even, here we are after Operation Gladio not learning the lesson and instead just saying, well, it works, so let's just do it again. I mean, it's it's disgusting that our governments would have this, this uh, such disdain for their own population, no care for their own population is what that is showcasing. So they put together these groups, uh, the, the idea, these gladiators. So, so now when we see things like um, the Kerch Bridge bombing and also, you know, and then what did they do? What was crazy about that is they actually in the news tried to blame the Russians. Well, the Russians did it. And then with the Nord Stream pipeline, like blowing that up too. Oh, the Russians did it. They're blowing up their own infrastructure because that makes a ton of sense. Or maybe, maybe you guys have these Operation Gladio style groups that are going around enacting terror and bombing and and uh you know and doing all of these things and it's actually you doing it and then you're wanting to blame it on russians in order to escalate it let's talk about the attacks on the media so one of the things that you uncovered with project alchemy is that they are targeting independent media outlets like the gray zone with plans for lawsuits censorship intending to shut you down what is their plan who are they targeting well, yeah, sure. So, I mean, I think that that, that it, it was supremely striking to us that, I mean, uh, within days of the uh, proxy war uh, erupting, um, we, we were at the top of the British state's agenda. Um, I mean, censoring and suppressing us was <clears throat> was like kind of a, a core objective uh, because they knew that we were going to um, um, publish things which were contrary to the narratives that they wished to perpetuate. Um, and 
you know, it is stated that uh, uh, repeatedly in um, these documents that the, the bleak reality uh, for Ukraine of the battlefield needs to be concealed in order to keep this going, in order to um, maintain pub Western public support for this continuing to convince the Ukrainians that they're in with a chance of winning when uh, they stand zero chance of winning. Um, but so, yes, um, censoring um, outlets like our own um, was at the at the top of their agenda, and they suggested all manner of um, uh, uh, methods of doing this, including um, law lawsuits to cripple us financially um, and uh, f f uh, force us to close. Now, what's really interesting is, um, our, our, I mean, I have my suspicions that all this is all interlinked. Because one of the, the, the last, some, sorry, not last, in summer 2022, we uh, at the Grey Zone revealed how um, celebrity journalist Paul Mason, um, uh, this kind of fake left British journalist, um, was plotting to take down the Grey Zone in secret with this individual called Amil Khan, who's this um, kind of veteran British um, psychological warfare specialist uh, who was very active in the Syrian proxy war running uh, PR campaigns for the head chopping lunatics that the CIA and MI6 were using as their proxies in that conflict. Um, yeah, the, like he, the, the, the pair of them Khan and Mason were, were planning to take down the grey zone uh, via uh, some kind of John Oliver style stunt or full nuclearly illegal to uh, cripple us financially, um, speaking in terms that directly echoed the wording of this document. Um, so, um, and uh, Anil Khan was tapped to be part of Project Alchemy. So, I mean, um, that does tend to suggest that Mason's planned attack on us was this British state directed effort. Um, and the fact that we were exposed this might account for why I was um, detained and harassed and digitally strip searched uh, the last time I returned to the UK, which might be quite literally the last time I returned to the UK. Um, I was just going to ask you know, if you've been play. back. I was just going to ask, uh, since you've been labeled a dangerous individual and was detained the last time you went back home, are you, so you haven't been back since and you don't think you, I mean, have, did they ever file charges against you or anything? Did they give you any insight no. into more as to why they detained you? Well, I mean, they said that they're, that, I mean, the last that I heard from the, the British police was that I'm still under investigation. I'm not sure for what. Um, but, you know, I mean, I was stopped under uh, counter-terror legislation. And yes, there's been this spate of, uh, of journalists and uh, uh, activists um, having their doors kicked in in Britain at dawn and their digital devices seized. Um, Richie Medhurst, who's a very popular independent uh, British-born journalist who lives in Austria, uh, was arrest literally arrested coming off a, a, a plane in Heathrow. I mean, I had a team of armed uh, counter-terror police waiting for me on the tarmac um, uh, to escort me to a, a backroom interview. Um, he had a team of armed police officers uh, waiting to handcuff him literally the second he stepped off the plane um, yeah. and hold him in in uh, hold him in, in a cell for 24 hours without much in the way of explanation of why he was being held um, and uh, with no access to his family or lawyers. Uh, and he has been uh, since uh, re released, but bailed and 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 bailed again, and has to go back to the UK and faces uh, terrorism charges. So I mean, it's not the, particularly... the the West. You know, the free press West that they you know they they're touting as we're the we're the free societies we're protecting and spreading our freedom all around the world. And yet, I know three of you just in the last few months who've been detained. Three journalists. You, like you said, Richard Methurst and uh, Jeremy Lafredo in, in Israel, right? I mean, that I know yeah. personally that I've had, I mean, that's, you hear about these things in the news of somebody this or somebody that, but to, to, to know you guys, to actually have this happen to you guys, and it's in this short window of time, this is, I mean, this is the crackdown that they're doing and that they're implementing, and we're supposed to be the free West, and there's nothing free about this. I mean, this is, They've become every, it, just like everything, just like what I see in Israel, you know, you become the thing you fear. And they feared so long, they would tell us all about China doesn't allow free press, Russia doesn't allow a free press. This is what dictators do. Dictators don't allow this. And yet they've become everything that they've claimed they're fighting against, everything they claim they'd feared. They're, they've become the monster. 
And it's, I mean, this is what happens, it, you know, it's human psychology. It happens on a small level when a child is abused by their parent. Oftentimes they grow up and become an abuser. And we're seeing that mm -hmm. um, in so many different manifestations, but this is just one of those, you know, it, it's just a, a absurd. And now, yeah, if I were you, I'd be afraid. If I were Richard Medhurst, who's also a UK citizen, right? I'd be afraid of going back to the UK. And I know Jeremy Lafredo has no plans of going back to Israel at this point, even though, you know, they stood there in court and they, when Jeremy's like, deport me, get me out of here. And they're like, he doesn't mean this. He's Jewish. Of course he loves Israel. He doesn't mean it. You know, he, of course he wants to come back. Like, let's see, yeah. he's crazy. He's obviously nuts. I mean, this is, you know, so they, they view him as one of theirs. And yet, and the UK, obviously you're theirs and Richard Methurst, and yet this is how they treat their own. I mean, this is absolutely absurd, but so you haven't been back. You're still a dangerous individual. They haven't told you why they're investigating yes. you. I mean, unbelievable. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, it just, I mean, I, I think, I think, I mean, yeah, you mentioned, you mentioned Je Jeremy and I, I mean, I think that was, um, it, it was absolutely unreal uh actually um how um uh quickly that could have escalated and i mean yeah. he was facing uh being charged under um uh, national security legislation where the maximum penalty is life imprisonment or death yeah um yeah. for reporting on thing things that the israeli media reported on and i think that uh, i mean i'd like to think that the the massive pub public pushback where thousands of people were emailing their elected representatives emailing um uh, the state department uh saying what the hell is this get him out now um uh, may well have uh, uh helped free him um you know i mean i think i i i heard him say that yeah like literally the only reason that i'm actually I mean, because he's being held in solitary confinement in a in a, yeah. in a prison where where palestinians get raped to death uh, you know, and like, the reason that he's still alive now is because he's a U.S. citizen and white. Uh, you know, like I mean, that he is extremely fortunate uh, to have gotten out unscathed. And yes, I don't think that he has any plans to return. And uh, indeed, Britain is not particularly high on my um, holiday destination list, um, to, no, say, to say to, to say the least. And and it's just also it's also this is the thing is I think that yeah I think that we we, we are. But if we, we have reached a, a point where the um, the, the West, Western um, uh, security states are so determined to maintain narratives that their only response is to, is just is uh, crackdowns now. Like yeah. it's with uh, you know, like Palestine, particularly where you have uh, a pretty crazy and unique situation where uh, the, the almost the entirety of the world is behind the Palestinians um, and uh, is opposed to what Israel um, is doing. But um, most governments in the world are one way or another supporting this. And, you know, like you, some of the biggest protests in modern European history and some of the biggest in, in um, uh, West Asian history, you know, lots of Muslim countries, their populations are you know, unanimously behind um, the Palestinians, but their governments, because they're co-opted by the West, are supporting Israel doing this. Um, so, I mean, I think that in that, in that situation, um, it, it, it's protecting the narrative at all costs does mean that they are willing to start jailing people and, you know, smashing people's heads in at, at, at demonstrations um, because they're so, they're, 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 they're so desperate um, to uh, keep the war machine going and there is a huge and ever-growing um, anti-war sentiment. I mean, you're in Britain, uh, the Labour government <clears throat> Uh, of Keir Starmer, which um, has uh, taken a very hawkish um, uh, line on Ukraine and has said, we will support Ukraine as long as it takes, um, and we are going to send them billions a year. Uh, and um, is Starmer is allegedly talking to Macron about ways of keeping this going if if, if um, the US pulls back from from, from the proxy war. Uh, there is zero public support for this whatsoever. Like, you know, the UK is suffering, as Project Alchemy um, predicted, terribly um, econ e economically. I know a large number of people who are really struggling um, to make ends meet, despite the fact they you know, have 
superficially reasonable salaries because the cost of living is just completely insane um, as a direct result of uh, the sanctions that um, uh, Project Alchemy um, uh, uh, advocated uh, for aggressively. And the sanctions, as you mentioned, have not harmed Russia. In fact, um, they, their economy is growing um, uh, at significantly uh, higher rates than than Europe, um, there is f uh, something like full employment, um, and uh, there has a, been a huge splurge in consumer spending, um, you know, which has been acknowledged with, you know, pr pr presumably begrudgingly, like in the mainstream media now. And if you look at polls um, uh, conducted by Levada, which is this uh, uh, very reputable um, and much cited in the West polling firm, um, it's uh, it's finding that Russians are are the most uh, optimistic about the future they've been uh, since the since polling began. Um, they the overwhelming majority of the population is happier than they were a few years back. Um, you know, I mean, this couldn't have backfired more spectacularly. And the only response of the British government is to double or triple or even quadruple down on this. You know, such such is their determination to not lose here. It's quite it's it's frightening. And it just doesn't make any sense. I mean, it, it, I, I'm sure it does somewhere to somebody who's clearly um, planning and plotting all of this. They've got their reasons as to why they want to take Russia down, but it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense for the rest of us. That's for sure. I mean, maybe it makes sense for a group of wealthy individuals who want to make more money and and they've got their plans, but it doesn't make sense for anybody else. Um, excellent reporting on this, Kit. And I do encourage everybody to read this piece to get more details on it. So the, the piece is in the gray zone, leaks expose secret British military cell plotting to keep Ukraine fighting. Um, we do have the link down below on that. Um, I mean, it's just, I just, the minute I always think, you know, we're turning a corner on things. I mean, I mean, we'll see. I mean, what do you think? So Trump is gonna come into office. He thinks that, you know, he's been running on, he's going to end this war. Putin has come out saying, you're not going to end it. There's no way you're going to end it. Um, and now you're, you're reporting that the British are saying, yeah, we're, we've got, we got plans to keep this going, even if the U.S. decides to, to stop their funding and support of the war. Um, what do you predict is going to happen in the next year with this war? Do you think it's going to dwindle down? Do you think it's going to continue on? What are your thoughts? Well, I mean, <clears throat> I think on the, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry, I've got to stop smoking. Um, there, the, I mean, I think on the one hand, the, on the one hand, like the, the war from the US perspective has to end. Now, I, I reported on a, um, um, a, uh, a report published by RAND, um, which is this Pentagon think tank, uh, and um, it, which is very influential. Uh, and it, it published a report in July, which completely passed me uh, and indeed everyone by. It didn't get any media report uh, pickup whatsoever. Um, but it effectively spelled out the fact that the US is in real trouble militarily. And because it's sending so much um, ammunition and equipment and vehicles to Ukraine, um, it is very, very, very vulnerable and would not so uh, the uh, US military would not survive first contact with um, an actual conflict. Uh, the the uh, the America's defense industrial base has been destroyed by outsourcing and neglect to such an extent that they cannot replenish what they have sent to Ukraine um, with any ease or speed whatsoever. So, and it, it specifically talks about how uh, the, the report specifically says that we need to end, um, or, uh, or, uh, set, we need to stop sending all of this material, particularly now that Israel requires uh, all, all of those bunker busters to you know, kill Palestinian women and children. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, the, uh, the, the, so, for, for, so on the one hand, I don't think that that this can be kept going much further, um, uh, just just in in practical physical terms. I think that the British are not going to give up on this, although um, uh, you know ultimately they are completely dependent on the the, the US um, uh, to just to even have a military and maintain and, and maintain their um, very uh, much reduced and and uh, uh, crumbling navy. Um, so I mean, I th uh, th while there may be 
insane people within uh, the British intelligence circles, as as we've reported on, who want to keep this going at all costs. Um, actually, ultimately, if the US steps back from this, um, then it is over. Uh, and because Europe doesn't have the the uh, the weaponry or the the, the money uh, to just uh, to just uh, keep throwing throwing this stuff into the black hole of Ukraine. Um, and I might add as well that I mean it, it's rather forgotten now. But in September 2021, there was the um, you know rather catastrophic U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan, and there was a, a some um, British officials who said, "Well, maybe we sh we could just stay there and form a new international uh, brigade to uh, continue the uh, military occupation of the country." I mean, just completely insane, delusional rubbish, and that was, of course, never came to pass because it was fantasy, um, you know. So, um, I uh, and I and I think that the it, 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 the example of Afghanistan is something that we we shouldn't forget when we think about Ukraine ending because I yeah. mean in June in June 2021 Ghani who is the western puppet in power in Afghanistan flew to DC Washington DC um and there was the he had photo ops with Joe Biden and and White House spokespeople talked to spoke of the US's uh and Afghanistan's uh, deep and hearing bond and US commitment to uh, uh Afghanistan's uh, uh democratic uh, f future. And then three months later, Ghani is on a plane to the UAE and he hasn't been heard from since. Like this stuff can, can shift very, very, very quickly. And I do think that if you look at polls, um, in most countries, people are sick of this and want it over. Um, in the West, um, there are polls of Ukrainians, which show that there's no region of Ukraine that has majority support for keeping this going. Um, Zelensky has made some coded comments about um, handing over territory, which was, of course, um, you know, unthinkable mere weeks ago um, before uh, Trump's election victory. So, um, you know, whether, regardless of of the, the uh, of, of Britain's determination to keep this going, um, uh, I, I, I think it is likely to wind down. Um, I strongly suspect that, again, in the spirit of Operation Gladio, there is likely to, when this ends, um, be a wave of um, uh, 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 terrorist violence across Europe mm. because you now have a large, large number of extremely bitter, battle-hardened um, Ukraine war veterans with easy yeah. access to weapons and um, a major chip on their shoulder because of the you know, because of their betrayal by by Western countries. Um, there is a, a, a the a there was a British government report which talked about at the start of last year, I believe, which talked about uh, how this was a real real prospect, and the security services had no mechanism of uh, monitoring this risk and 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 weren't keeping an eye on it. And that's yeah. just in Britain. Um, you know, you mentioned that there are you know, Ukrainian refugees across Europe. There are, again, we've reported at the Grey Zone on this uh, this, this neo-Nazi group called Centuria, which is setting up chapters all over um, Europe and is indoctrinating, specifically seeking to indoctrinate Ukrainian refugees in ultra-nationalist ideology and and is also running youth camps in Germany and all sorts. So, um, oh, yeah, I think that the, uh, the war's shadow is going to loom large over us uh, in Europe for a very, very, very long time, one way or another. Um, yeah. And that's really frightening, actually. <laughs> it's really it, frightening. It is. It is, uh, for sure. But it just goes to show that um, you know, because when those, I, and I think, I think you're right, we're probably going to see a lot of that. And it'll be interesting, the shift in the narrative, because what they've been saying for the last, I think, since the Gulf Wars, you know, since we started going after the Middle East, was that these are a bunch of Islamic terrorists, right? It's the Muslims. They're not like us. They don't have the same values, the same religion. It's them. And in reality, it was just the destabilization of the Middle East that then caused all of these refugees and people to flee. And of course, some people are angry. They don't, they're not being truly integrated into society. And there's like a whole host of, of issues that cause, that cause this, right? And it'll be an interesting shift when it's these like white Christian, you know, Ukrainians that are, that are then it's going to be an interesting, it, but it will showcase and maybe fast enough for a generation to learn um, that it isn't about the religion 
or the culture or the color of the person's skin, but it's about destabilization through war that we have been engaging in decade after decade after decade all across the world. And that when you do this to any group of people, no matter their religion, no matter their race, no matter any of that, their culture, that they will that they're that it's 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 going to breed this resentment and this anger and you're going to end up with these terrorist attacks and um you know ill feelings and that's going to that's that's any group of people so i think that'll be an interesting narrative shift you know when that happens it, it can't just be the same old blame that we're putting on you know oh it's just these muslims and that's you know largely what israel rides on right now in order to commit the atrocities that they're mm -hmm. committing which is that these are all a bunch of, you know, human animals that want to murder us and massacre us because they have a different religion, you know, all in the name of God or something along those mm -hmm. lines. Um, and it's all just, you know, it's mm -hmm. bull, but, but I think it's, it's uh, unfortunate, but you know, we've got to learn our lesson somehow. I mean, people have to ultimately rise up and, you know, the, the governments that need to be overthrown in my opinion are our own. I mean, we need to overthrow the military industrial complex aspects of our of our government, the aspects of our government that are not for the people, but that are for making mm -hmm. a lot of money. And they're they're in for the big money interests and they're not in for the actual people. And they're willing to actually sacrifice us and our lifestyles and the dreams that we have yeah. of of you know middle class lifestyles or whatever. They're they're willing to sacrifice all of that to gain whatever it is that they're trying to gain. And I think it's time that we wake up as a population, many of us have, but many have not. You know, get them to wake up and realize that the governments that are that are hostile are towards their populations are our own towards us, and mm. we should be worried about that. So, Kit, thank you again for being on the show. Where can people find you? I do have the link down below to this article and also to your Twitter account. Um, where else can people mm. can people find you? Yeah, sure. So, um, yeah, thanks for linking to my Twitter because you basically can't find it searching my right. name on Google. <laughs> okay. Usually, 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 when you search for someone's name, it's like the first or second result, and um, yeah, yeah. like you can't find it. You're too and you dangerous. You also can't Kay. find You're too my... dangerous. Indeed, indeed, and like you also um, dangerous individual. Um, yeah, I, I was. I found a clip of the, the former head of MI6, Richard Dearlove, who was who was fundamental to all the fake intelligence that, that kick-started the, the Iraq war in 2003. I found this clip of him referring to me on live TV as a very unpleasant little journalist, which uh, I was quite thrilled by as well. But um, yeah, you can he find me on little? my website, which is- I'm just quite, did he, did yeah. he actually say the word little? Because you're like the you're like the opposite yeah. of little. As a Kid is Absolutely. like six, how tall are I mean, you? I don't know what it is in, in like feet in American. I'm, I'm six, I think six. it's like, you're like six, six. Yeah, you're a big guy. You're a real big guy, yeah. but you're little. In, little in, in, and, and it's a yeah well it's just <laughs> also as well i mean it's also as well i think that uh yeah i mean uh little no um unpleasant that's you know debatable uh but yeah the, i mean um <laughs> you can find you can find my website which is again uh can't be found via search engine which is just kitclarenberg.com um and i publish a lot of my writing through there so um may, uh, also i might add as well that my uh my uh dear uh, friend and collaborator Alex Rubenstein and I, um, we have uh, an investigative uh, project called Active Measures. We do a weekly stream, but we also do um, video investigations um, and um, uh, and exclusive interviews. So you can find us there, Active Measures. Uh, but again, thank you ha for having me on, Kim. Yes, yeah, thank you. I, I do. I'll put all those links down below um, for Active Measures, also for your website, kitclarenberg.com your Twitter account because you're a dangerous individual that no one can find. And also to this article, to the gray zone, you do great work, <laughs> Kit. Um, thank you so thank much you. for being here. Thank you for your great work. Okay. God bless you. Take care, Kim. Bye-bye.